Okay. Hello, uh, good afternoon. We're going to get started. Uh, people may be straggling in. Um, I'm uh, Tom Mate with Vital Strategies in New York City, and um, the two uh, chairs for this meeting unfortunately couldn't make it, so I'm sitting in for them. But we have uh, four uh, great speakers on the topic of cook stove intervention trials. Uh, like, what have we learned, and where, where is the field going? Uh, and the first speaker will be Rogelio Perez Padilla, who works at the Sleep, sleep Clinic. Uh, he's an investigator at the National Institute of uh, Respiratory Diseases in Mexico. Oh. Thank you very much for the presentation. So I'm going to jump over a few slides that introduced the theme of biomass, uh, but it was uh, dealt with in the previous presentations and go directly to the intervention trial. This trial um, was designed uh, by many collaborators, but the health part was in charge of um, the National Institute of Public Health and specifically uh, Isabel Romeu that was a researcher at that time. And the idea of an intervention trial is uh, precisely to avoid some of the biases uh, that uh, appear in the observation, observational studies with, related with biomass because as you heard uh, before, the um, use of biomass uh, for, as a fuel is associated with many other things, including uh, poverty. So the, the trial was to compare the use of uh, improved biomass stove, uh, vented stove, um, with a traditional uh, open fire. And the trial was in the Michoacan state. This is the, we are here, and this is the state of Michoacan. And these are the communities. Mm, uh, those communities are uh, with a low socioeconomic status, and several of them are uh, indigenous communities. Uh, they are near or around the Lake of Pascuaro, and these are the communities, six communities. Uh, as a work previous to the trial, there were studies done on the impact uh, of uh, this uh, improved stop on air, air pollution. These are concentrations of PM 2.5 before and after the, the use, or with a traditional uh, stop and with the improved stop, uh, quite important reductions in, in PM 2.5, uh, but not outside the house. This is near the stove and this is at the kitchen. However, the reduction in the personal exposure was uh, about uh, half. Uh, it was re reduced to half. It was m reduced uh, much more on the concentrations around the stove and the kitchen. So the health impact uh, was uh, designed as a trial after one year. Um, in, in women, uh, uh, respiratory symptoms and lung function uh, and lung function decline was was the uh, parts that were explored, and in children, respiratory infections and uh, symptoms. <laughs> now, the houses uh, that were selected um, should include uh, at least one woman and one child uh, younger than four years of age. And uh, the procedure included a monthly visit um, with a questionnaire asking for symptoms or infections in the previous 
uh, two uh, weeks for children and general respiratory health uh, for adults and spirometry before and after uh, bronchodilator. So this is the final publication that was uh, in the Blue Journal uh, 2009. So these are the characteristics of the control group and the intervention group. So the, the procedure was um, all women were using the traditional biomass stove and by um, randomly they were selected to um, immediate um, change to the improved stove and the other half was uh, changed after one year. So there's only one year intervention really. So these are the, the characteristics of the two groups and um, uh, they were quite similar, uh, um, mean age of 24, 26, and this uh, asterisk, uh, there are significant differences. So the, the group of the intervention group had a little bit more chronic phlegm and two years uh, older. Lung function was um, uh, exactly the same. So the results of this uh, trial in women, no differences in analyzed groups as intention to treat, which is the a way to analyze a randomized uh, clinical trial. However, one, one of the important issues that appear is that the inter intervention uh, group um, had poor adherence to the use of the improved stop. They still had the other um, open fire and uh, they kept using the old uh, traditional stop or both at the same time. So, um, so that's why uh, there was an additional analysis in the paper that, that you saw. Uh, see how much uh, the symptoms were modified by the real use of the improved stop and. You know, there, there were less symptoms in the real users of the Patsari stove, but you know, the randomized control trial disappeared and it, it was more of an observational study that was precisely what, what uh, was tried uh, to avoid. In terms of um, users of the Patsari or improved stove had less cough, difficult breathing, uh, eye trouble, and headache. And here you see uh, the, the users of uh, the improved stop had a reduction, significant redu reduction in several of the symptoms, and some of the symptoms were also uh, reducing the groups that mixed both both stoves. Uh, here you you can see that there's um, uh, the, this is the prevalence of symptoms and several of the symptoms um, check just two of them cough and phlegm. So in this bar there are this is the prevalence in the persons that kept using just the traditional uh, stove and there is sort of a dose response. Uh, lung function, uh, again, as an intention to treat, it was not modified at all. And we analyzed the FEV1 decline in users, and that this was presented uh, previously, but uh, it was milder decline in the uh, users of uh, uh, the improved stop. Remember, this this is not anymore uh, uh, intention to treat uh, analysis. Um, 
we recently uh, follow um, uh, the women for now for eight years and um, comparing uh, the users versus the non-users, uh, we didn't find a difference in decline. Uh, adding to the controversy that was uh, mentioned before. So in conclusion, no significant difference in lung function in the control and, and intervention as intention to treat, but there was a poor ad adherence to intervention, like 50% at, at one year, and the use of improved stop was associated with less symptoms. Uh, also, a study in children, uh, these are the two groups, uh, monthly visit with a questionnaire and examination. The population uh, was uh, not so bad, 80% with full vaccination. Uh, these are the characteristics of the mothers and 20% uh, stunting. Uh, low uh, length or height, uh, poor, uh, very little exposure to tobacco. So, but, you know, there was no severe pneumonia in the, during the year. Uh, this is the rate of uh, upper and lower respiratory infection. And no significant differences as intention to treat, again, in children. Uh, and if you analyze as well, comparing the real users and non-users, uh, this is the baseline. Again, um, little differences in the two groups. And um, the children in homes that use regularly the uh, improved stop had a reduction in the time uh, presenting respiratory infection. Um, you can see here uh, the fraction of the follow-up time with upper or lower respiratory infection was uh, higher in the uh, persons that live in a house uh, still using the open fire. So there were fuel savings uh, proved uh, moderate reduction in personal exposure, I, I said about uh, half, but poor compliance with the stove. And, uh, you know, this also has been analyzed and what were the reasons. But uh, one of the main reasons is that to make tortillas, they need a big, big comal, and that was not uh, provided in the improved stove. Uh, it was much smaller. but. Also, the communities with more indigenous um, uh, prevalence had some ideas about uh, uh, how good was uh, the traditional burning stove. But, uh, you know, this is a problem in, in other trials and um, that has uh, to be solved. Uh, no health impact as intention to treating women and children. This is the main result of uh, um, randomized controlled trial. But when you analyze the real use, there are some improvements in, in um, symptoms, uh, especially. But then you are, again, with the same problems of an observational study that the, the users, that persons that kept using the traditional stove, had other characteristics, uh, including associated with low socioeconomic status that uh, don't allow you to make strong, strong conclusions. Now, um, randomization was within the same community, uh, and um, I talk about compliance the moderate reduction in exposure. Uh, it was one year long. Th this had to do with, with um, you know, agreements with the community. Uh, they didn't agree to wait more than one year to have the, the improved stove. 
So this is a limitation because, you know, exposures in reality are lifelong, even before uh, the uh, birth of the children, so during pregnancy, and this is one year that, of course, is insufficient for some chronic uh, um, diseases. And the group of women uh, were younger because it was required to have um, uh, children uh, younger than, than four years of age. Uh, also, the community didn't have a severe pneumonia. So there are some of the things uh, that could be discussed but basically uh, um, a negative uh, ran randomized control trial as a uh, intention to treat. Um, uh, thank you very much for your, your attention. Are there questions? <laughs> questions for uh, Dr. Perez Padilla? Um, well, I have a question, which is <clears throat> that type of intervention, which mainly uh, is just venting the smoke rather than uh, improving efficiency. Um, was the community that it was tested in, uh, what was like the population density like, and is that a, uh, would that influence whether this type of stove would actually uh, help? Yeah, uh, you see, the exposure uh, is not reduced uh, as much because, you know, they, they go out and they still some smoke and they, they, they kept uh, inhaling the smoke uh, from other, other houses. So that's why the uh, personal exposure is not reduced so much. But, you know, this, the, this trial was designed in around 2004-2005 so and at that time there was only the, the Guatemala trial uh, go, um, going so there was not much uh, experience on, on this issue it was basically the first trial together with the Guatemalan trial so that was uh, you know the best that could be done at that at that time. Mm -hmm. So, two questions. Uh, one is regarding the adherence to the intervention. Uh, was this a, an issue of stove stacking, or was it that at, at some point the, uh, the, the stoves weren't performing as well? Uh, and the second question is what did you do for, that, for the control arm at the end of the study? So, were, were they also provided uh, stoves? Yeah, after one year. So that, that was a problem because, bueno, part of a problem now in retrospect because the intervention uh, could last only one year because at the, the one year there was an agreement with the community that all women would, is, were, were going to have the improved stove. Now, the, you know, these stops require uh, maintain, uh, maintenance, or, uh, which is one of the problems. But they were visited at least once a month. And, um, but, you, you know, that, that is uh, something we have to think o o all the time, that they are not just uh, forever as they were built. They need uh, cleaning and so on. Um, but I, I think the main problem was to make tortillas with the, with the stove. The comal the, is this size, and usually they they have a bigger size comal. They, they don't like it. So from a past study, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Will Checkley, who's professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine, associate professor, pulmonary and critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins, to an ongoing future study.
Well, thank you. And again, it's a pleasure to uh, speak with you about our uh, uh, ongoing studies. I'm going to talk about two particular studies that are, uh, you know, that are ongoing or just starting. And they focus on interventions with uh, liquefied uh, petroleum gas stoves. And it's not only just giving the stoves, it's also providing gas continuously so uh, that we can actually achieve high compliance of use. Again, no complex. Uh, this is, uh, uh, these projects are kind of funded by uh, a, just a variety of uh, different institutions, including NIH, the, the Gates Foundation, Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves. And I won't go through these slides because we know what the problem is. This is quite an important problem around the world. Uh, biomass fuel smoke is the third leading factor in, uh, in the burden of disease with 100 million disability adjusted life years. But I wanted to, what I wanted to point out is that there has been a change over time in, in some settings, specifically in Latin America. We've seen, kind of in the Americas, we've seen a change of like biomass fuel use from having a prevalence of about in the 40s uh, to about 14% uh, nowadays. Much less of a change in Africa. You see it's kind of remained in that uh, high 70s, uh, uh, high 70s use, and in Southeast Asia as well, where you see uh, st still kind of a, a quite high prevalence of use, uh, even even nowadays. Um, but I think I wanted to come to a point that uh, that that uh, Dr. Perez Padilla made, which I think is quite important. And coming back to like the studies that have been conducted to examine the effect of reducing household air pollution through biomass burning stoves, one of the issues does come to be, uh, does come to be compliance. The RESPIRE study was conducted in Guatemala, it was about 500 homes. Uh, the, the actual intervention uh, resulted in a 50% reduction in carbon monoxide. Uh, and uh, when they actually did the analysis as intention to treat, what they did, uh, what they did not find an association between childhood pneumonia and uh, and their intervention, but it wasn't until they actually got to the exposure response analyses that they were able to find some differences. And seeing that, and part of it, is this is that reduction of mis uh, or that the reduction in the misclassification of exposure that is provided by the exposure analysis that can help with it. Nonetheless, I think the issue still remains in traditional exposure response analyses when you're thinking about intervention trials. You break randomization, and it no longer rem it's no longer a randomized trial. Uh, or you, you cannot use that same type of inference. So I think this is a key part. I think we still have to figure out better epidemiological or statistical approaches towards exposure response analyses that allow for causal inference. Uh, the, other, the other thing that we've seen is that we have uh, a couple large uh, cook stove trials that have been negative, and especially looking at, at uh, health outcomes. This is one that was conducted in, in Malawi. Uh, Kevin's study, uh, huge study, 10,000 children in 8,000 households. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of the, the primary outcome was pneumonia, and they were not able to find, they, they did not find an effect uh, uh, on intention to treat analysis with, uh, with pneumonia outcomes. Uh, and here in this study, pneumonia surveillance was done in a passive approach, which is basically children coming in to health posts, and that information was, uh, was recorded. This is a study in Nepal that uh, I had a chance to participate. It was led by Jim Tilsch. Uh, it was, again, a large intervention study. It was about 4,500 homes. Uh, uh, sorry, it's uh, 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 3,300 homes. Uh, the original target was uh, 4,500 homes. Uh, and uh, 5,000 5, children. And here, surveillance for pneumonia was done in an active form. So we were visiting children weekly to assess for respiratory symptoms. Uh, uh, you know, we did pulse oximetry as well. But, uh, but, the, but it was in an active form. So when the children had met I, IMCI criteria, we would consider that as a pneumonia. Here, uh, the reduction was uh, in, in particulate matter exposure was uh, less than less than 50 percent. Actually, it was closer to only 30 percent. And also, we didn't find uh, an association in, in uh, between the you know between the intervention and pneumonia incidence in intention to treat analyses. 
So the, uh, there's been several arguments that have come from these uh, large trials. One of them is the issue of uh, are we are we using um, and interventions that are that provide clean enough air? So still biomass burning, uh, biomass burning is probably leading still like uh, to a good amount of exposure. And then the other issue is that. Uh, as, as, as Rogelio brought up, brought up, you can have a really nice biomass burning stove, but then it's not going to be used because it didn't meet the purposes for cooking. And uh, it, could, it could be that they're still burning biomass, uh, you know, they're still burning biomass in the home using traditional stoves for plates. And I think that's, this, is, this is a big issue. And I think uh, it's being recognized that, that one, just the solution of biomass burning stoves with a chimney are not going to cut it. And two, if, if we're going to go towards clean fuels, you have to be able to provide it in a way that it's continuously. So this is kind of being our, our uh, aim in, in, in kind of the next two studies. So first describe the cardiopulmonary household air pollution trial. It's, uh, this is set up in Puno. Puno is in the, uh, in, in the uh, southeast corner of Peru at the edge of Lake Titicaca. Uh, I usually like to compare Puno to a mix between Mongolia and uh, Scotland. And instead of having like fields of heather, we have uh, fields of purple quinoa in the, uh, in the ground. Uh, and in this study, uh, we decided to include 180 homes. Uh, and um, we wanted to test the effect of having an LPG stove. So we give uh, households an LPG stove. And we give them as much fuel as they want to use. Uh, so just, we, and actually our team is going there every week or every 10 days, depending on what's needed, to be able to switch the tank of, uh, the tank of LPG fuel so that they can continue uh, cooking with LPG. Uh, our primary outcomes are being focused around cardiovascular and respiratory uh, outcomes. Blood pressure was the kind of the main cardiovascular outcome. And in respiratory, we did have a peak expiratory flow and reversibility. Uh, and of course, we're also using a questionnaire uh, to measure respiratory symptoms and respiratory symptom health-related quality of life through the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. And then we have a whole cadre of different uh, uh, secondary outcomes, including nutritional values. We're actually even also measuring salt uh, intake uh, to see if that could help explain mechanisms with blood pressure. And, uh, and other, the other behavioral outcomes, like uh, understanding adoption, use, and we have these uh, temperature monitors, the stove use monitors that help us understand patterns of use in the intervention stoves and in, in, the, uh, in, in the control stove. So it's 180 participants. We randomly allocated to intervention and control. We're doing a rolling, kind of a staggered enrollment over the year, about 15 per, uh, per month in permuted blocks of two to six. And then we have the kind of baseline quarterly assessments for our outcomes. Uh, and with the exception of some of the secondary outcomes, they only measure baseline and uh, and, and at, at a one year. Uh, we are limiting it to the primary cooks, who are mostly women aged 25 to 64 years of age. Uh, and we, we, in a couple of our exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria that they don't plan to move, that they are using a biomass fuel stove daily for cooking. Uh, at least they have at least one bioman, biomass burn. And that they, in, in, in our setting in Puno, most homes have a kitchen that's separate from the main living area. So we decided to stick with those uh, homes that had those characteristics. But in terms of inclusion criteria, we just, uh, you know, we wanted to include adult women that were, not, that, that were not either pregnant or planning to be pregnant, that did not have hypertension at baseline or not in hypertension medicines, that did not have COPD or active pulmonary TB, in, the, in, in our study. So, and uh, the study is actually broken into two components. So, the first year, uh, the, uh, the, the way we decided to do this is that uh, the intervention homes get the uh, LPG stove, and then they get as much fuel as they want, and we're kind of coming, going ahead and delivering it. Uh, and at the end of the year, that's when we just tell the intervention group, well, thank you, we gave you a year of fuel. Uh, now, in year two, it's going to be their responsibility to go ahead and get their fuel by themselves. The control group uh, actually will continue using their biomass burning stove for the, or, uh, for the first year. At the end of the first year, they get, a, they get an LPG stove, but uh, we are then actually, we're giving them all the fuel they want, but now they have to just go ahead and pick it up from the, uh, from the LPG stations. 
and we've pro we're going to be providing them with vouchers that would allow them to just actually use those vouchers to go ahead and pick up those uh, pick up the uh, the stove. So here in the second year, it becomes more of an implementation flavored study in which we want to see sustainability of use in the other intervention group. Once we're giving them a year of fuel, are they able to sustain it? And then in the control group, it becomes an initial adoption as now knowing that they have free fuel and they have to make the effort to go and get the fuel, how many uh, do this and uh, how is it maintained? Uh, so that's the idea. So the study site is uh, rural Puno. Um, here is a kind of a, a, a GIS map of our location or, or the spread of, spread of our homes. Kind of those blue dots are where the LPG distribution centers are. Here, the green dot is our weather station that we've, we've placed here. You, uh, I think Tommy had a question to Rogelio about kind of distance between houses. So we went ahead and did calculations of distance between homes. And at least in our settings, we find that there's like a football field of separation uh, from the kind of the nearest neighbor on average. Uh, so it's, uh, it's you know, quite a distance. So it's different than in, in, in some urban settings and in, 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 in other countries where there may be a contribution from one home to the other in terms of household air pollution, let's say, of, I think that was an issue in the study in Ghana uh, where you had intervention homes next to homes that are not being, that are not part of the study and there was kind of a filtration of, uh, of particulate matter because these homes are still kind of using the traditional sto stove. So this is not an issue in our study. We have enough separation. Uh, we have, uh, we have our, our, our team, like we actually kind of strap on like four tanks in a motorcycle and they go around the community. It seems like to be kind of a hazard, explosion hazard, but so far it's been working out and they're responsible to make sure that the delivery is being done adequately. And then the other thing is, and I think this is something that was brought up by Kevin and I've uh, realized kind of the complexity of doing environmental assessments. So we have all these devices, you know, just uh, we're using the, uh, the enhanced monitor from uh, RTI, it has a, a kind of a little pump that is able to get air in and it's able to tolerate very high uh, concentrations. Uh, we use kind of real-time devices for, uh, for measuring CO and also for measuring NO2. And then, but we also have uh, a, you know, just standard approaches like the, we use these Ogawa badges to passively measure NO2. So it's, uh, it's a good amount of work to do these environmental assessments and we're doing them quarterly here. Uh, in terms of, uh, we also realize that it's just not the LPG intervention, just giving them the stove and the fuel. There has to be uh, a behavioral component to this. So, uh, and we learned a lot about our, during our formative re uh, research, what it means to like, uh, making sure that they, they don't feel that the food tastes any different. So we had to do this Pepsi challenge where we said, okay, we're cooking with a biomass stove and with the LPG stove and the food tastes the same. It's not any different. Uh, just kind of making sure that it fit, that, that we address safety concerns and costs. Uh, and, uh, and I think these, these, these were kind of all important issues. And uh, we actually set up these cooking demonstrations where before we roll out the uh, the LPG stoves of the homes, we come in and say, okay, we're gonna actually show you how you can cook your traditional plates in the LPG stove. And I think this is being very successful to be able to help with, uh, with the use of the LPG stoves. And we also have kind of promotional messages. We have like the calendars, we get to hang out, hang up in the house. We have these stove use monitors. These are like little temperature monitors that we put in both the, the, the traditional stove and in the LPG stove to monitor use. Uh, and then, uh, and of course, we're kind of following quarterly for kind of behavioral issues. So I'm going to show you some, some initial data, exposure data from our study. Uh, so we, in a subset, we also had a chance to do one month measurements. But here you see box plots of the kind of the measurements kind of separated between the control group and the LPG group. Uh, the LPG group is in red, the control group is in, uh, in green. At baseline, as you expect, there's a good amount of overlap. In the, uh, in the distribution exposures. But at month one and month three, you see a good amount of separation. It's about a 10 decrease, uh, a 10 fold decrease in area concentrations. And it goes down to close to that intermediate, uh, to the intermediate target from the WHO. 
And, and personal exposures, we see kind of the same thing. We see kind of like no, no difference at baseline, and then kind of important reductions, uh, important reductions. And we can actually, the, the LPG group gets down to that 15 microgram per cubic meter, whereas the, uh, the control group is staying at that 80 microgram per cubic meter level. Um, so this is, this is CHAP, uh, and, and we see similar trends in carbon monoxide, both kitchen and personal, and also in nitrogen dioxide. We see kind of important reductions in nitrogen dioxide. Um, the next study I want to talk about is the Household Air Pollution uh, Intervention Network trial. This is a, a joint NIH and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation-sponsored trial. They've uh, put uh, close to $25 million to, uh, into the study. Uh, and uh, it, it, it is, a, it is a, you know, just a, a pretty wide collaboration across many institutions, both the U.S. and, uh, in, uh, and, and institutions in Peru, Rwanda, Guatemala, and in India. Uh, and the objectives here is to be able to kind of provide evidence to, uh, to, uh, regarding potential health benefits of, uh, of, uh, by reducing household air pollution through uh, clean fuel intervention, which we've uh, chosen liquefied petroleum gas uh, as, our, as our intervention. So we're giving, similar to our study, in our, our, our smaller study, we're giving a stove and all the fuel that they can use. Uh, and uh, here, you know, again, it's, it's going to be a randomized trial where we're rolling it out in uh, four different countries. It's going to be held in, in, in Peru, in our site in Puno, in, in Guatemala, in sites that were that, that are adjacent to the re respire site, in uh, in Rwanda and in India, and uh, there's there's quite a variation in geography across these settings, and it goes all the all the way from kind of sea level in in, in India and Tamil Nadu, all the way to our stratospheric altitudes in Puno, that's close to 4,000 meters above sea level. Um, the the study design is uh, we're going to be enrolled in 3,200 homes. Uh, it's going to be individual randomization. Uh, the the criteria are that the homes have to have at least a pregnant woman and that is not nine to 20 weeks pregnant uh, at the time of enrollment uh, and uh, they'll be then um, and and, and uh, then then they'll be then randomized to receiving either the intervention or the control and uh, we expect that we'll have about 25 percent of the homes will have an older adult woman where we can actually measure one of the primary outcomes which is blood pressure and then we're also going to be following the uh, the offspring so the in, uh, there's an index child that will follow over time so the pri so uh, so in terms of eligibility criteria you know we're, we're targeting um, women uh, pregnant women aged 18 to 34 four years is between 9 to 20 weeks gestation non-smokers and they use biomass fuel uh, stoves daily and uh, so that, those are the criteria so the intervention is like a high quality locally available LPG stove with at least two burners in our CHAP trial in Peru we uh, through our formative research we discovered that most women actually preferred three burners so we had to go to a, a local producer and ask them to build a three burner stove and I think uh, the different sites are also kind of having different approaches as to how many burners they, they want. We're going to provide LPG fuel continuously for 30 months. Uh, and uh, the idea is to promote safe and exclusive stove use during this time. Uh, and it's going to be very similar. I think uh, different settings are going to have different ways of delivery. We've been considering just kind of continuing with our approach has been quite successful in, in Puno. Primary outcomes are birth weight. Uh, child pneumonia, growth in kids, and adult blood pressure. And uh, we're powered uh, for an intention to treat in combined analyses and uh, uh, within, e within sites as well. So in terms of, we have a whole series of secondary outcomes and, and, and biomarkers, which I won't go into. And in terms of exposure assessment, uh, the idea is to be able to roll out, we'll have at least three uh, measures of exposure during pregnancy and at least five uh, in the adult, uh, in, the, in the older adult women, and, and at least three in, in the children, uh, and we've we are still kind of in in a decision point as to what are the devices that we're going to use uh, to measure particulate matter and how we're going to do it. Here's an example of how we're doing it in chat. Uh, for personal monitoring, what we actually did is uh, we developed this apron 
that uh, women actually like and has a, has a lot of pockets and has actually been quite useful for day-to-day -day life. And they've actually asked us, they, they like to keep those. So we actually made them and gave it for them. They can actually keep them. But they have these pockets where we actually can put the, the monitors and uh, just are easy to use. Some of the challenges in the, in the, in the HAPIN trial, we've had a good amount of discussion about how to make sure that we're standardizing uh, the study across all settings. It's just that the streamlining the methodology across all the four sites uh, has been kind of, I think, a, a, uh, uh, a complex issue that, that we've uh, had a chance to move forward on. I think the just study logistics are always complicated. A lot of um, you know, devices, they need a lot of electricity. Uh, so in, in intense field schedules, uh, we're doing one or second the outcome actually requires early morning, uh, you know, or at least fasting. So that means getting leaving the, the field office at three in the morning, four in the morning, to be able to get to the uh, field uh, to, to the field and to the participants uh, before they have to go out to do their usual farming activities. Um, issues of relying on technologies, you know, I think the environmental devices. There's a lot of troubleshooting issues that we have to still de still to deal with. Uh, and uh, we're kind of in the, in the mid, in, in terms of our early wins, we kind of finished our scoping and our, uh, and our, uh, our, our initial pilot interventions to show that yes, we can achieve quite low, uh, quite low levels with LPG stoves. Uh, and we're currently kind of working on recruitment strategies that are, that are going to be, uh, the, uh, and the idea is that this, this study will start in, uh, in, in January of 2018. So thank you. I'm an John Fold from Cambridge. Uh, it's a really uh, incredible undertaking um, that, that you're, you're facing. Uh, one of the questions I have is, I suppose, um, for some of these families, what you're offering must be quite transformative, um, not having to get fuel, pay for fuel. Presumably, it provides heating as well. Um, does that mean that people might have more money for food, for nutrition, for might there be many, many ways in which this impacts upon their lives? Again, I think you, you're completely right. It's not just uh, giving an alternative form of cute, uh, cooking, because I think there's a lot of time savings that occurs. We're discovering this in the, in the, in the chapter, and we, you know, we had, had anticipated some of these things as well. As you say, um, you know, the chapter is much shorter, and everybody's getting the same intervention. At the end of one year, everybody gets the same intervention. But I think the issues of time uh, use and, uh, and socioeconomics does remain because we find that women don't have to wake up early enough or use some time of their day to collect fuel. Or you know, just the fact that you can actually have wood right there to be able to just, uh, you don't have to like, go and collect I'm, I'm the wood to actually burn it. So, it's, uh, so that it, it still becomes an issue. I think one of the things that we've discussed and happened is what is that, what is that appropriate, uh, in, uh, what's the appropriate uh, approach for the controls that could help offset yeah. that intervention, the, the, the cost of that intervention. Yeah. So we're still discussing that. I think we've talked all the way from a financial incentive yeah. to, uh, to just providing a small package of goods um, that would help in chat. That's what we're doing in CHAP. In CHAP, we, go, we give a small package of goods, let's say just common kitchen yeah. supplies that are needed so that they don't waste time going to the shop, let's say sugar, salt, uh, rice, and among other things, without it being a huge economic incentive. I think we've, we had multiple discussions at the time. We said, oh, why don't we give them the control arms, uh, the control arm wood? Yeah. And I was like, I said, well, that's kind of equivalent to giving cigarettes in an intervention. And I was like, why would you give them more wood <laughs> to burn? Uh, so I think that's, uh, but I think that those are some of the discussions that are still, uh, that, that we're still having. And I think we're going to have, we're going to need some of those local solutions to address the socioeconomic issue from giving uh, fuel. Okay, Carolina Chiang, Stockholm Environment Institute. So yeah, the, the study really looks interesting and I like the aspects dealing with users, which I think would really be useful in informing the outcome. So one of the questions I have is um, based on, on the likelihood impact of this research. So there's knowledge generation. So for instance, showing 
the health benefits or reduction yep. of use of LPG. But then the intervention is designed so you have households who don't purchase fuel and are now receiving yes. LPG as much as they want for free. So um, is the assumption then that this information would then lead to, I mean, it, it doesn't seem likely that you could have a government nationally rolled out program that provides free LPG. So I think you bring so, so, uh -huh. what would be so you bring impact? some very important questions about uh, how to implement this at kind of the policy level as we go forward. Uh, so to to answer kind of the first point, as I, I think these both these trials are aimed as proof of concept. The idea is that if we reduce air pollution to a low enough level, can we actually see health benefits? Because it's still. I think we still feel that there's a good amount of equipoise in this, uh, in 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 the role of, of household air pollution and many of these health outcomes. So I think our main goal is right now on efficacy, and we we want to do is eliminate uh, eliminate the uh, pollution from the home and see what the health effects are. Uh, I do agree that this is, this becomes an issue for scalability. I think we've had some early wins also in, in terms of being able to inform policy. And from our CHAP trial, we've uh, had a chance to uh, liaise with the Ministry of Energy. And the Ministry of Energy in Peru has a program that's called the Fondo de Inclusión Social Energético, which is a, a social fund to be able to give poor homes um, a subsidy for LPG. And they only provide one tank subsidy, it's about 50%. And we have had an opportunity to share our uh, consumption uh, uh, data from the chapter and say actually most homes actually get to use about two tanks a month, which to them was kind of shocking. But they are open to considering this as, uh, you know, as, as we kind of generate more data and share it with them as to the, could they increase their policy to actually provide subsidy for more than one tank. Because they are also interested in making sure that there is that, it, that their program is scalable and that, it, that, it, that the LPG is being used at a continuous level. So I thought that was an early win. I think in terms of scalability, I think um, you, uh, you're right. I think we have to put it in kind of the local contexts. Uh, in another setting where we work in Uganda, um, you know, we're surprised to know that, that people are actually buying charcoal and that it's the same cost as the actual LPG tank. Uh, if you actually kind of cost it out, it would be pretty similar in cost. And I think um, I, I was kind of surprised at, at, at seeing the number. So I think as LPG prices, you know, if there's any, as LPG prices go down, and I think, um, you know, like you can get, and I think in Peru, I think a tank of gas is somewhere around $10 or $8 to $11. I bet you that price can actually even be driven, hopefully lower down with more, uh, with more demand and kind of better delivery chains. Uh, that, that, that could provide some, uh, some possibility for scaling scaling up something like LPG. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to allow time for, I think the next two talks are going to also lead to further questions. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Checkley. And now Caroline, who we just heard from, uh, who's a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute, will talk about some of these cultural and behavioral issues that have been alluded to. Yes, so I'll talk about adoption, preference, and use of improved or clean cookstoves, and I'll be sharing lessons learned, so primarily from my PhD research project that entailed measurement, comparing an improved cookstoves with a traditional one, so in terms of performance in indoor air pollution reduction, and I also did some personal exposure assessment. But, but my focus today is not on that, but on the behavioral aspects of adoption. And then also experiences from my current work. So I work as a research fellow focusing on household energy, and we've done some evaluations in uh, different countries. So my present, first I'll 
give an overview why do we need clean cookstoves and fuels. So as a background to adoption and why that topic is important and what really is a clean cookstove. And then I'll go into the determinants of adoption. So based on this, the study that I did in Kenya as well as the other studies I've been involved in. And then come up with some recommendations for research, so including randomized control trials and some policy recommendations. So what is a clean cook stove? So I think for a while there's been uh, difficulty in terms of or uh, confusion in terminology so that you had uh, different kind of stoves that were being promoted as clean or health promoting stoves, but very basic and not really achieving that benefit. But there's been work towards coming with a common terminology. So, and this is that a cooking solution with the low particulate and carbon monoxide emission levels. So more of an improvement from the traditional open fire. So then within the improvement, there'll be different tires of performance that would be used to characterize the stoves. So the, these are examples of improved or clean cookstoves, so including the one on the, on the right. And then why clean cookstoves? So probably you've heard a lot of this, but I think it's important in informing as a background into why there are still efforts to promote clean cookstoves. And yeah, you have the, a large population relying on biomass, then 4.3 million premature deaths linked to the exposure from cooking with the biomass. And then you have 12% uh, of ambient air pollution globally coming from household air pollution from cooking. There's climate impacts through black carbon emissions. And then aside from the health and climate uh, impacts, so sort of the higher end impacts, there are considerable impacts on livelihoods. So with several hours being spent in fuel wood collection, and some of those are actually more apparent uh, to the households and are a more determinant of, of uh, adoption than even the health and climate impacts. And then the, project, the projections are that there's still the population relying on solid fuels will remain unchanged. So then there's a need to then consider what happens with this population. And uh, so a number of SDGs would be achieved if uh, you get a shift to clean cooking fuels and stoves, and then uh, you have stove designs that are demonstrated that they can actually work in reducing the pollution and personal exposure. So then the question is, uh, w what are the challenges for adoption and why are these cook stoves not realizing the benefits that is expected? So one issue is the type of stove and characteristics. So that's drawing on some of the studies I've done. So the characteristic of the stove <coughs> determines whether it's adopted or not. So in this picture you see, for instance, that's a solar cooking stove. And then there are also these fancy cook stoves as well. So and uh, when you look at the setting and the type of people, the type of uh, pots that people use and the types of food that they cook, they, there's no way this type of stove can take hold in the community. So uh, as we talk, cook stove programs are failing, that there are some that uh, have probably failed right at the design phase because the way they are designed, it's, there's no way that they are going to take hold and be used in the community. So, so that's one of the key factors that has influenced the adoption. Then we have some 
fuel-based characteristics as well that are important. So, so from my research, people, and anyway, from personal experience as well, I've grown up in a setting and cooking with biomass fuels. You, you have uh, different, uh, the, the traditional stove, which is that one, can be used with different types of fuel. So you can, uh, it can be used with, for instance, those uh, maize cobs, so that are used a lot, agricultural residues, during uh, harvest period for cooking to supplement wood. So then if you have a stove that cannot accommodate that type and just needs a specific type of wood, then it's not likely to be used or it would be used alongside the traditional stove. And then it, uh, traditional stoves can also accommodate fuel of a very large, big pieces of wood, while a number of the improved cook stoves or clean cook stoves have required that the fuel is cut into small pieces. And the, the women don't have the time to do that, the, I mean, the processing of wheels to that, again, after gathering them. So that affects performance, but also the characteristics of the fuels themselves. So from the study I did, uh, the, this, this stove, the, the, oops, the improved stove, the rocket stove, so one of the things people said is that, uh, you can't use it. When you use fuel that's not very dry with that stove, then it becomes even smokier than traditional stove. So with traditional stove, if the fuel is not too dry, it can still light up. The rocket stove required that the fuel is completely dry. So that then led to mixed use of traditional and improved stoves. So then a lot of issue related to the Stove user characteristics. So there was yes, use mixed use of traditional and improved cook stoves, and this was uh, nearly similar to the findings in, in Mexico. Over half the households reported that they used both the improved and traditional stoves, and consistently. Uh, so so there was no switching to the new stove. And, and that's been seen in many other settings as well. And in a number of households, you'll actually find even the traditional stove, they have more than one. So it's placed in different. When there's light cooking, there are guests, for instance, then you have like four, three of the stoves burning at the same time. So then if you have an intervention introducing a clean cook stove, and now it's one stove, so they'll still need to supplement it with other additional stoves. There was I improper use of the stove. So, so the way this stove was designed is that um, it's supposed to maximize uh, heat transfer. So then uh, the, the pot should almost cover, should fill that whole part, so you should not be seeing fire because that's now wasted heat. And when it's being constructed, so they would measure, so ask the household to give the pots, that the pot that they regularly use, which then is a, not the real situation because they'll use different pot sizes. So when, like in that picture, using a smaller pot, then all the heat trans, the efficiency gains are lost. And then that's supposed to be a fuel shelf which is put at the bottom to raise the fuel so that there's air passing at the bottom and that improves combustion. But then uh, in almost 90% of the households, nobody was using it. So they were just putting the fuel the way they would put in the traditional store. So that as well affected performance. So in my third picture, the households found a different and a better use for the stove as a place for storing things rather than for cooking. So the stove was definitely not in use, though in some they would claim to be using. But can you imagine the effort of clearing the effort of clearing the whole place and then cooking and then returning them? So 
they, they were not using the stove for cooking. And then um, equally and very important uh, is that there was also behavior modification due to the new stove. So, so what's happened, you have uh, a lot of the kitchens and maybe this is a very location specific issue. A lot of the kitchens had no window, so you have only a small hole for ventilation. And the reason for that is because it's expensive to construct a window, it costs more money. So then they don't, and the hole has to be small because otherwise you have predators and they keep chicken in the kitchens. So then you want a hole small enough that no animal can get in through. So then you had a very dark kitchen generally. So when cooking, then the fire actually provides light. So then with this new stove that conceals the fire, the rooms become dark. So as a result, they had to light kerosene lamps. So during the day, most of the households with the stove had uh, a lamp lighting lit as they cook. And uh, from what we know, kerosene is also as much, has as much pollution emission as the stove. So then the behavior modification could have probably even led to increased pollu pollutant level in the household. So anyway, the, the, the result on the indoor air pollution and personal exposure from my study showed non-significant differences between the traditional and improved cookstoves, which could be explained by all these factors. Because in the same population, I also measured fuel use using kitchen performance tests so that measures fuel use under actual conditions of use, and it was quite significant, the, the reduction in fuel use. So, but then the same was not applying to the pollution concentration levels. So, the, the, there are a number of cultural determinants that uh, explain also some of this behavior and which also imply there may be, some of them may be difficult to, to, to change. And it, like even when doing research, because so what, there, there's the test preferences, for instance. And uh, there, there's also some attachment to the traditional stove. So in my community, to get married, for instance, it's called that somebody has gone to cook. And uh, part of the process is to, to get one's mother-in-law to help you set up a traditional cook stove and to cook there. So the, the, the traditional stove is ingrained in the people's culture. So to make, to make a shift then is something that might take time. And then there are like certain rituals uh, and traditional practices for which then fire serves more than just a cooking purpose. So what this implies partly is that you can't have one solution that fit all, so you may need to account for different cultural contexts when designing a stove solution. But then uh, one also needs to, act to take into account culture is dynamic, so people change. So the taste of uh, food on traditional stove, you move from rural to urban and people completely forget about it. So that's, that's good news in a way because otherwise it would be impossible to design a stove for each different cultural community. And then people also make trade-offs. So the, much as they like the traditional stove, they also appreciate the value and cleanliness that they had so many factors they highlighted as disadvantages of the traditional stuff. So there's, there's still um, high level of willingness and uh, wishing that they would have clean cook stoves. 
And you also have these similar characteristics shared across different settings, which therefore means that similar solution can apply across different settings. So in the light of all that, some of the specific recommendations I would make, there, there's a need to understand the user behavior, especially factors that motivate continued use of traditional stoves and how this can be addressed. So a lot of research focus on this new stove, but there's a very little to try to understand this traditional stove. What is it about it that people like? And uh, how is it that, uh, they are, well, what sort of behavioral interventions can complement this uh, clean cook stoves technology so that people accept them as well? And there's need for more qualitative research methods that go deeper than the traditional methods in, in order to get to understand these factors that motivate use and non-use of the clean cookstoves. And there's need for a more systems approach that focuses beyond the technology and <coughs> cooking device, but look at how does this technology improve life for this person, and that in itself then may make them accept them. And then use a segmentation to allow better targeting of the intervention. So within the, in the three billion who use biomass, there's so many different categories of people. So it's almost like saying three billion people <laughs> cook with clean fuels. I mean, there's such, differences and I think that's one of the factors that tends to get overlooked. So then you have a solution that there are um, populations that are ready to move to cleaner forms of cookstoves and even to pay for it if it were available. And then there's need to focus on prioritizing focusing on benefits prioritized by users. So f the, the stove I evaluated was self-purchased. People paid money themselves to buy it. And the reason they were buying it was because it was uh, reducing fuel use. And my measurements confirmed that it was reducing fuel use. So then that should be the, the promotion effort and the focus of that promotion that this is a fuel saving stove. But it's not a stove that's going to impact on health. So, and for that, then one needs a different type of intervention. Because otherwise, then, there's a lot of apathy generated that cookstoves are failing to meet the health goals. But that should, is not what they were aimed for in the first place for some of those. And then for RTCTs, take into account user behavior in research design and interpretation of the findings. Because if you are, so you have a randomized control trial where the stove is the treatment, and then people are not using it, or they are using mixed stoves, and all kinds of things, then essentially you, you really have no intervention. So you are just measuring socioeconomic differences or something else that's impacting on health. So right from the, I think it's, it's a very critical valuable to take into account when designing research. Thank you. If there's one uh, pressing question, then we'll, I've been kind of slacking off as moderator, so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe it's a question to you and also other speakers. Uh, you alluded in the behavior modification slide. Uh, you talked briefly about uh, lighting, kerosene lighting, and, and its possible contribution to the emissions. Huh? Yeah. But I'm just wondering, in your work, uh, I know you did not do any measurements, but uh, did in, in, in your work, did any of the results indirectly uh, sort of talk about the impact kerosene lighting has on, uh, on, um, on possible household air pollution. I, I'm, I'm asking because there are a few studies that have shown that uh, actually kerosene lighting uh, um, actually has a significant contribution. 
um, not, not in RCTs, they are mainly observational studies, and maybe also for other speakers. I don't know whether, I know John Bams has done some little work. Uh, we've also done some little work in Uganda, but I don't know whether in these other studies, uh, you know, there was some possible questions in the survey related to lighting and whether they had some statistical significance relating to air pollution. So, so for this study, I did not, uh, I was focusing on the clean cook stove, but then I was also collecting data on uh, some of the possible determinants of the air pollution and exposure. So then kerosene emerged as one, and there's now increasing research showing that kerosene is not clean, as was thought. So, so the last speaker is uh, Dr. Kevin Mortimer. He's a reader in respiratory medicine from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Good, so I think um, I can do a slightly different and maybe slightly shorter talk than I was planning because uh, of the excellent talks that have gone already and uh, some of them have, have covered some of what I would uh, pl have planned to say. So may I have my uh, slides? Ah, oh, excellent. So yeah. So I'm tasked to talk about uh, what we have learned and implications for future research from cook stove intervention trials. And I can shorten this because some of these have already been very nicely described. Um, this is what I was going to do. Uh, clinical trials that were reported before the study we did in Malawi called the Cooking and Pneumonia Study. Then to tell you about this one, CAPS. Um, and then trials reported since that. And then clinical trials in the pipeline then drawing, on, drawing some implications for future research and implications for policy. Um, so I'll do this, but maybe a little uh, quicker with, uh, than originally planned, because we've heard nicely about the first trial of a biomass burning uh, cook stove, the Patsari stove in Mexico, followed far quickly by the Respire trial in Guatemala that tested out a very similar uh, chimney stove called the Plancher stove on pneumonias in young children, uh, recruiting pregnant women and those with an uh, infant. Ne neither study found a significant impact on the primary outcome of interest. But uh, both studies in secondary analyses or per protocol analyses did find some significant findings. In this context, of all of this clinical trial evidence, the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves was uh, launched uh, with a stated aim to see 100 uh, million households adopt clean cookstoves and clean energy by uh, 2020 um, on the basis of, the, of um, all of that uh, uh, convincing uh, trial evidence. Um, and this is what they have on their website. Uh, in terms of health, it's, if you can't read it, the, the bottom sentence is, the adoption of clean cookstoves and fuels can save lives and reduce illnesses. And I really wish they would tell us which stoves her, uh, are proven to save lives and reduce illnesses because the global community needs to know this so that they can invest in them. Uh, so is this the truth? We live in, the, in, a, in a world of false facts. I recognize that. Um, <clears throat> So also before um, uh, CAPS, but, uh, and, and much criticized, perhaps unfairly, so it hasn't actually been published uh, in full yet, th uh, this one, uh, perhaps because it was stamped on quite so hard, because it couldn't possibly be true that this chimney stove had uh, uh, no effect on multiple health indicators measured over a four-year uh, period in India. I rather wish they would publish this in the peer-reviewed literature, because we need this data out there too. Um, so we did the cooking and pneumonia study in Malawi. Here is Malawi. Malawi is a landlocked country uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, bordered by Tanzania, uh, Zambia, and uh, Mozambique. And uh, we decided to uh, run this study in the opposite ends of Malawi, so Karonga by Lake Malawi, and uh, down here in the south in the Shiri River Valley. Um, and we, we wanted to conduct a study on scale, a definitive study that would uh, answer um, maybe not once and for all, but uh, in this context, whether a biomass burning cook stove could have 
uh, health or perhaps life-saving potential. So we did this on scale, 150 community-level clusters, over 10,000 children, uh, two cleaner burning cook stoves um, compared to traditional open fires. The outcome was a, an important outcome in that context, pneumonia diagnosed to IMCI criteria, partly because if we were after x-ray diagnoses, there would have been no cases of pneumonia because there are no x-rays. Um, and we followed up all the um, participants in the study for 24 months. Um, so um, here is a uh, three to four minute uh, film to tell you the story of CAPS and uh, get, allows you to see some pictures of Malawi and it's a little bit more relaxing than listening to me uh, talk about it. Uh, so if I might trouble the people at the back to click the bu button that makes the video play, please. Can you click the, yeah, there should be a video. Um, if not, I, <laughs> there's no video. Doesn't run. It did run in, in uh, Hall 4, you know. Well, just imagine the scene. <laughs> it's, um, it, uh, I can talk about it. Uh, if the, so um, what you're meant to see here is uh, you know, a beautiful film that tells you, shows you some pictures of Malawi by uh, Lake Malawi, by the um, Shiri River um, Valley. And it will um, show you uh, these cook stoves um, in, uh, in action. Um, this is the, the sad end of the, uh, of the story. Uh, so I'll start there just in case someone manages to make the video work in the meantime. But these are the cook, the cook stoves. Um, uh, turned upside down here for repairs. Um, uh, this is uh, Bright, one of our, uh, a number of stove doctors we had to uh, employ to uh, keep these uh, stoves alive over the course of the study. Anyway, the film would have shown you how these uh, cook stoves can burn uh, very, very uh, cleanly. They burn biomass fuels, uh, little pieces of uh, fuel, about 90% less fuel than uh, would be burned in an in a open fire to do the same am uh, amount of uh, work. Um, so about 90% less fuel, 90% uh, less emissions if you, uh, in, uh, in labo laboratory tests. Um, and households loved these. The um, levels of adoption weren't uh, um, ideal and there was certainly still stacking, but these stoves were um, really valued. Um, each household had two stoves, a solar panel to charge the battery inside, and the purpose of the battery was that it uh, powered the fan that blew air through the fire, made the fire burn more efficiently, and therefore uh, less emissions and less, uh, less smoke. So that was the rationale. Um, the bottom line is that uh, there was no effect of uh, the intervention of two of these cleaner burning cook stoves and a solar panel on pneumonia in young children. Um, absolutely uh, convincingly uh, no signal of effect at all. Um, in terms of serious adverse events, um, there, was a, there was a signal of a slightly increased risk of malaria in the clean cook stove group. Um, but that may have just been a kind of reporting uh, uh, issue of, around a, a secondary outcome. Um, but on the positive side, um, there was a reduction in burns in the cook stove group. So non-severe burns were substantially reduced by about uh, 40%. Levels of pneumonia, the same in the two groups, um, about 15 cases of pneumonia um, per year per child on average. Sorry you didn't get to see the film that to told you that story, but if you'd like to watch the film, it's on the Lancer website. Um, technology, it's against me. Uh, <laughs> because this, this technology was against me. Um, this technology is against me. So here's the stove graveyard. Um, now the graveyard is really, really big. So almost none of these cook stoves uh, su survive to this day. Um, what we, ha what we have left behind is a somewhat toxic legacy of um, lead-acid batteries. So each of these cook stoves has a nice chunky lead-acid battery in it that now is at the end of its life and is being destroyed in the ways you'd expect it to be destroyed in a poor uh, rural 
setting in, in Africa, so they're being thrown in holes, uh, thrown in the river, um, thrown in the lake, burned. Um, and so no effect on pneumonia, a beneficial effect on burns perhaps, maybe more malaria, and certainly a, a toxic uh, uh, lead uh, legacy. Oh, well, that's CAPS. Um, five years' work, three million pounds of money. Uh, the answer was no. Then um, a study in Nepal, also just published an abstract, and this, is, this study was again done some time ago, and again, I think, needs to be published in full, but um, Will has told us a bit about this study, so I won't harp on about it. There's this nice study that we haven't heard about yet, the Peru Kitchen Sink and All trial. It's called something different to that. But this was um, a community randomized controlled trial um, in 51 communities, 500 households. And this, was, this had lots of things. You know, it's a in household intervention package. It had a chimney stove, kitchen sink. Um, no effect on acute lower respiratory tract infection in children, which was one of the things they were looking at, a slight but non-significant reduction in childhood uh, diarrhea. And this is the stove that was used in that study. Recently published, and again one we haven't heard about yet, I don't think, um, is a study in Nigeria. It was recently in the Blue Journal, household level randomized control trial using ethanol compared to um, open fire cooking. Um, but this trial kind of changed over time, so the protocol was changed a couple of times. Uh, and at first the control group was just people who were using uh, wood, and then the control group changed to people who were using wood and uh, kerosene. The primary outcome really isn't stated clearly. It was something to do with blood pressure in women. Uh, um, but exactly what they were looking for an effect on uh, wasn't clear, but what was emphasized, of course, was the effect on diastolic blood pressure, um, but no effect on systolic blood pressure in this group of pregnant women. So I think it kind of leaves us a little uncertain of, well, what was the intervention, what was the control condition, what was the primary outcome, what really is the message? Um, this is a study that we are awaiting uh, eagerly awaiting the results of a study that has completed in Ghana called GRAFS, an LPG versus BiLight versus uh, open fire um, trial. The full trial of, of reports are weighted and the, and the attention in this one was again on pneumonia in young children. Um, but what has been reported in abstract form is the birth weight and other obstet obstet obstetric outcomes in this study of pregnant women. And that has found no effect of LPG or, uh, or the uh, biogas stove on the outcome of interest. So not an overwhelming amount of evidence even now to support those claims that uh, clean cook stoves and fuels can save lives. Um, but what's in the pipeline? We've, we've heard about the last two here, so I won't mention those. And there's um, three other smallish studies that are also looking at um, uh, impacts of cook stove interventions um, alone on various health outcomes. So the last few slides, um, what are the implications for, for research? Well, I think for, if we accept that this is a problem that affects about you know, 3 billion of the world's population, that it's a problem that kills 4 million people a, a, a year, um, which I might point out at a conference like this is over two times the number of people who die of tuberculosis every year. Um, we certainly need more research than this. You know, this is a whole conference about uh, um, uh, TB and lung disease, and how many sessions and how many studies of, uh, in relation to TB are, are justifiably being done and reported on. But in this area, there's almost nothing. Um, we need to challenge the conventional wisdom that's out there and these widely accepted truths, you know, that um, even the, as I think some of us were discussing earlier, you know, the evidence that uh, household air pollution is associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease as it is defined nowadays needs to be uh, challenged. So we need to get the basics right, um, and we need to think outside the box the cook stove comes in, i.e., it's not all about cook stoves, it's about the air that we're breathing. Um, it's all well and good making the uh, open fires go away, but if the tobacco epidemic is coming along into sub-Saharan Africa, well, any good that we've done obliterating the problem of uh, open fires will, have be, will be completely undone by the tobacco industry. 
So lastly then, what about implications for policy? Um, at the moment, I think that cookstoves are not evidence-based health interventions and everyone out there, not in this room I'm sure, but out there needs to stop implying that they are and there have been some uh, very strong implications that they are, including some of us might have seen in Malawi the health claims relating to the clay stoves, which, you know, plastered all over the city of Blantyre, these stoves save lives. That is not the truth as I see the truth. Uh, we need more evidence-based and less eminence-based policy and decision-making. There's certainly been a lot of eminence-based uh, policy and decision-making. Um, we need ev investment into generating the evidence, not in wildly distributing uh, cookstoves willy-nilly around the world. And, of course, it's time to put the horse back in front of the cart. And there was a nice picture of the horse uh, behind the cart, but... The technology is gone, and this thing says my time is up, which I guess that means the machine's saying. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks anyway. Maybe take a couple of questions and then. See if, we, if there's time to uh, to run the video because I I have uh, I think I've seen it and it's quite good. <laughs> so what, well, let's start with the questions while. Uh, okay, yeah. thank you. I just I just have a one question. I come from the TB camp. My name is Luis Cuevas. I'm from from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and it is whether in children to have pneumonia you need to have a bacteria or a virus, and and I don't know what the evidence it is that is for. Is due, pneumonia is due only to air pollution unless you have a, a co-infection there. And in a way, it seems to be a complicated uh, term of events really to get to pneumonia. And so I, I wonder whether we know air pollution in adults causes other chronic conditions, accident, uh, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular problems. So whether is the outcome is, is the right one in children. And I also have another, another question, if I may, is that uh, in, in, in Europe, for example, if you're going to buy a car, it's more, it's more uh, attractive for the population this time to lease a car. It's a low payment, it's a small payment uh, every month. And then uh, it will be cheaper at the end to buy a car uh, up front and not having to pay a lease. And I, I, I wonder what that's what happens in, in LPG. So it's easier to buy charcoal that costs maybe cost one dollar every every two or three days instead of buying uh, an LPG bottle that costs fifteen dollars in one chunk. And so you have to disinvest all a, a, a larger amount of money, which in a way is, is is cheaper, but you don't you don't see it that way. Yeah. So Um, thank you. So on the thing about pneumonia, it, it, it's a little bit of a tortuous uh, uh, story. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the rationale is that the um, exposure to household air pollution means that it, in the lungs, the defense cells, be that macrophages, um, become loaded with uh, carbon and become less effective at their job of host defense. And then infection due to you know, pneumococcus or whatever, then can, can take hold more easily. So it's, if you like, it's reducing the threshold for, uh, or increasing the probability of other infections take, taking hold. So it's that, I think that's the theoretical um, basis. It, is it the right outcome? I mean, it, I think if you look at the, the evidence, you start to look into the evidence of um, around this, you know, there are four million deaths a year due to household air pollution. You start to find holes in it. Um, the, card, the, 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 the data relating to cardiovascular disease is all extrapolation from uh, how, um, ambient air pollution and uh, tobacco literature. O almost all of it. There's almost no direct evidence. Um, and then uh, when it comes to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, well, uh, as I've mentioned already, there are holes in that. It, in relation to pneumonia in kids, it's probably the strongest. So, um, so I think, and it's also the most acute 
uh, event and the, the commonest event. So, it, for, from the perspective of a clinical trial, it's quite a good good one to measure. If you wanted to measure chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you might need a, a study taking 20 or 30 years um, rather than just a couple of years. And the same thing for ca meaningful cardiovascular disease um, outcomes. I think you're also right about the the, the uh, choices in terms of fuels, and um, I mean my sense is that L and Bill's not here now, so I can say this: that LPG isn't the solution, uh, at least in isolation. Uh, what is needed is a clean air intervention. Hi, Jessica Elf from Johns Hopkins. Just a quick question. It follows quite nice. Uh, about what you just said. I was thinking about global climate change and if we replace everyone who has wood with LPG, where does all this LPG come from? And um, there's been a lot of innovation in uh, electricity and talk about needing to move towards renewable energies. We have batteries that can power cars for long periods of time and supposedly at some point soon will power whole households. And I know that there are challenges in really rural areas, but we have a wide range of people from um, urban uh, slum dwellers in, in India using unclean fuels to people in rural areas. And I wonder what uh, your thoughts are on electricity or other renewable resources and how we can push the envelope in terms of innovation, thinking about um, what other industries are doing. Uh, so I think you're, you're on to the money. Um, I, and again, I can say it because Will's not here. I mean, the thought of advocating for um, energy companies to drill for more oil and drill for more gas and um, put in place the pipelines and all of the natural disasters that go along with, with all of that. And then the distribution networks and all the motorbikes and the vehicles that are carrying all of these canisters of gas up and down the, the world um, on, a, on a scale that the world has never experienced uh, uh, to date um, horrifies me, uh, frankly, when at the same time there are renewable uh, options um, that I, I think absolutely have to be um, pursued. And it, it's a kind of no-brainer, really. If you imagine, uh, would, it be, would it be better for um, those people who are using um, biomass fuels to have uh, be using LPG at the point of use, well, well yes, but if you imagine the bigger uh, global pi picture, um, uh, it seems like a disaster to me, when there are alternatives, and as you say, you, could, you, know, you can drive a car for hundreds of miles on a, a Tesla battery, you can power an entire American house with a, a Tesla uh, wall battery. Uh, that's all so solar powered. So it's not beyond the um, ability of man to, to uh, or woman, uh, to uh, uh, find these solutions. Um, so I, I think you're completely right that that's where we should be putting our energy, uh, not, uh, not into drilling for oil and gas, personally. Um, one quick question. Uh, do you think uh, exposure during pregnancy uh, because most trials um, have not considered this part, but uh, there's at least one going or planned. Uh, so what was your, you know, before saying that uh, has no effect on, on uh, childhood pneumonia, so the period before birth I, I think could be, could be important. Yeah. I think you're right. I guess what the, the change I would make if I was doing another big study like uh, the uh, CAPS is to focus on clean air. And that would be an important group to study them, you know, ensuring that women and, their, uh, and the children in utero are exposed to clean air would be important. I'm not convinced that just picking off individual interventions um, in isolation, a bit like how, how Caroline, Caroline was uh, telling us, you know, you can give a nice clean cook stove, but then someone will light up a kerosene lamp and that will undo all the good of the, of the intervention. So I think it's a, it's a package of interventions that yields clean air that's needed, and that's an important group. Okay. Two quick, two quick questions. One, I wonder what was the adherence to the clean cooks of intervention? And then the second question is more policy related. And I'm wondering, isn't it probably time to detangle the 
energy access goals probably from the health. Because uh, if I take the example of the cook stove I evaluated, it's uh, a $3 stove, it's locally made, people liked it, and it actually reduced fuel use. And uh, the, the energy access is a problem on its own, even if you don't add health to it. Mm. The, there are so many consequences. And uh, yeah, with the projections, uh, it makes sense to have people to probably have better ways of cooking than they used to do before. Yeah. And even the households uh, do complain. The hands get dirty, house get dirty, it's smoky and so on. So probably it makes sense to then say those stoves do not benefit health, yeah. but then you want to have a clean energy access. And uh, I wonder if the same would still apply to LPG, because whether if people have LPG and they are still using those traditional and so on, there may still be no health benefits. And uh, there could be a more acceleration towards interventions yeah. that target pneumonia but have nothing to do with cooking. I agree with you. And I think that speaks to the point I was making about, you know, getting to the truth of uh, these matters and not just making wild uh, claims. Um, there are justifications for moving to clean energy per se um, without linking it to health. I think it's most unhelpful to just say arbitrarily that this intervention is a health intervention and will save lives and reduce uh, illnesses because that brings with it a very strong message to policy and decision makers in relation to health that they should be advocating for cook stoves, that cook stoves are potentially something to invest in from a public health perspective. And I would say that um, on the basis of current evidence, that would be an irresponsible use of Ministry of Health uh, budgets in low and middle income countries when there are effective and cost effective interventions that could be invested in for health. And on the compliance question, um, at, Compliance drifted down over time. It was difficult to get a firm handle on it with the stove monitors because the stove monitoring devices that were used kept breaking. Um, but self-reported use drifted down over time, probably to, you know, mo most households were still using the cook stoves to cook at least one meal a day right to the end of the two years, but there was definitely plenty of stacking going along. Um. I would like to ask, um, what do you think about electric stoves? Um, I think they are the best uh, solution to cooking, and I don't think they're like that expensive. Like um, I believe, like governments will like to invest in communities um, to give them electric stoves. So just giving a thought. Yeah, I agree. I guess it comes down to where, how does the energy get uh, generated in the first place, and and electric stoves, many of them do require a lot more energy uh, per cooking um, task. But I think that, um, taking this lady's point and, and yours, the ideal solution is probably relates to renewable energy generation uh, storage and then use uh, in electric uh, cooking modalities. And, and quite a lot of work is probably needed to make those much more energy efficient than they currently are. And so, that too. <laughs> um, I want to thank Kevin and Caroline and uh, Will uh, in Absetia and Rogelio for a great discussion. And I, there's a lot of uh, discussion to come. <laughs> um, and uh, so thanks all for coming and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>